We're not saying that he killed himself only because he listened to music or to the lyrics like this. But if it was in his mind and he already had this suggestion, the music gives suicide credibility. Sources and this can be heard on or seen, uh, mostly heard on Facebook, YouTube when they don't censor my shows. Uh, uh, Bit shoot, I think I keep calling it Bit Two. There's Bit Shoot and Bit Two, but it's only on the one, not on the other. I didn't quite set up the other. I can never tell the two apart though. And Mega, which is run by or used to be run by one Kim.com, who is a interesting character. If you are not yet banned on Twitter, please go follow him. He's a cool guy. But today is kind of a special day uh, because I am moving. I am leaving Thunder Bay very soon. And this is kind of my last show, actually probably one of my last activities, period, in the city of Thunder Bay. And as usual, I have a bit of Creative Commons media for you to enjoy, uh, part of a larger album. Uh, that used to be found on a, a service called Gemendo. I haven't checked if Gemendo is still up and running yet. It, I think it is. Last I checked about a year ago. It might be worth checking out. It is a source of all kinds of Creative Commons media, and or at least music. I think they even had an app in f for Android that you could download and listen to a, stream, a steady stream of, of new Creative Commons music and of a variety of genres to see if you could find something that's kind of up your alley. This particular clip is by a band called Bizarache. Uh It's a French group. Uh, I'm not sure if it's from Quebec or France. Either way, it is kind of a bit of a rock group, uh, or at least folk rock. And with that, I will uh, play the track. Hopefully you enjoy. And this is L'Espoir Fait Vivre. Sois peu 
de décence Ça te permettra de croire Qu'il reste encore un peu d'espoir L'espoir fait vivre L'espoir fait vivre them through music. They have been able to drive certain animals, I don't know whether they use rats or whether they use girls from girls dormitory, but, but they have been able to drive certain animals, basically bananas. I thought it was interesting. I thought it was interesting too. And that was, let's see my notes here, uh, one Pat Sir Fletcher Brothers from Freedom Village USA which is a clip from Brain Damage from 1988. I didn't note the episode. I probably should have on that one. At the time, you could like mail the Freedom Village USA a letter asking for a tape, and they'd send you a whole lecture about the dangers of satanic rock and roll and how you can get your uh, s test subjects to have sex with each other, I guess, by just playing rock and roll. So who knows? Maybe that BZ, BZ Ash... Uh, might have pushed some of you listeners over the line, and uh, now you have some embarrassing stories to tell. But that was an interesting kind of period of time when the religious right in the United States was freaking the hell out about rock and roll and rock music. And the idea that you could corrupt someone purely based on the beat, not necessarily the lyrics, I mean, there were people who were freaking out about the lyrics, too. But this particular pastor had a problem with the very concept of percussive music on a 4-4 beat. It's hilarious. I don't even know how they could have gotten that far, but they did. And so that, that was a real problem that people expended political capital trying to, to solve. And so when we look at our current political situation, you have to wonder how many people grew up with their parents and leaders in their community believing that. And does that make anything make a little bit more sense? Does that make the the current political situation make a little bit more sense? Perhaps. So anyway, the first thing I kind of wanted to go into this week, other than that little clip, is what happened to episode 10. Some of you who may be watching this on YouTube may have noticed that the numbers go, it's like episode 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, da 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 uh, 9, 11, etc. 
And there's this missing episode, which you can see on Facebook. You can see on BitChute. You can listen to on Mega. But you can't see on YouTube. And the reason was is because there was a copyright strike. Or at least a content ID claim against my account, against that video, because I played a record, uh, I think some Lanza, uh, something Lanza, an opera singer who died in 1959 and says so on the record, uh, and he was singing a public domain song written by Johannes Aschenbach, and it was really just him singing the song. There wasn't really anything else to it, which means it's in the public domain in Canada. He's been dead long enough that our law no longer protects him, or at least it protects the public's right to have access to that particular song to do with what we choose, but YouTube didn't agree, and YouTube decided to mark it as copyright infringement, and then I appealed it, and it, it took a good couple of weeks, like this was six or something weeks ago, and the appeal was made to the copyright holder, so even though this is a public domain piece of work, they asked the copyright, the old copyright holder, who used to have the right to restrict people from using this song in mediums such as podcasts and YouTube videos. And they did have that right. Up until 2009, it would have not been legal for me to use that material. And in the United States, it's still not legal for me to use the material because their copyright laws are different than the laws here. We are trying to harmonize them, but we haven't quite got there yet. So still, according to the laws in the books in Canada, my use was a fair dealing, or my, my dealing in this, this clip was a fair dealing, and in particular, it was in the public domain. So I should have legally been able to use it. But who was I appealing to? I was appealing to YouTube. I was appealing to YouTube, then appealing to the original copyright holder, who used to have a claim on it. And of course, their interest is just to deny everything, right? Even if it's in the public domain, even if they have no legal claim at all, of course they're going to say, oh yeah, you can't use that, if they're the type of organization that is restrictive in that sense. And so that's what happened. In addition to that, I also got slapped for using Garador Zero's paperback writer. That, I can kind of see Garador Zero may or may not have cleared their actual samples for that particular piece. but. What should be possible is I should be allowed to cut out that particular piece and leave the public domain piece in place. But they're not letting me do that. And because they're not letting me do that, I can't put the video back up. So that video has been effectively put into limbo on YouTube at least. And so the, the other thing I kind of wanted to get into is what happens when you have a group of people who keep getting censored and whose videos keep getting clipped up like this. And you put a little bit of work into something and then all of a sudden your your the work that you put in is just this brushed aside and it not just ignored but wiped away as if it didn't happen and I'll, I'll tell you what happens after this happens a couple of times to you you stop putting in that work you stop putting in the effort to create these things these these works that build on others the 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 creative output that allows you to connect to other people at least in the media in question. There's always going to be another way for you to be creative, you know, another way for you to skirt the censors and to, to find your way to, to get your message across, but at a certain point you just stop really viewing the particular medium in question as a reliable medium for you to get your message across, for you to communicate through. And at that point it starts making sense to use other alternative forms of media. And so when we see people on Twitter and on YouTube and on Facebook being silenced and have, being suspended or shadow banned or all of these things at some point I mean some of the people are going to just rejoin because it's still free to join most of these things and even if you have to do it under another name or an anonymous name you can probably get away with it but some people are going to just stop and they're going to give up on the idea of social media altogether and they're going to give up on the idea of YouTube videos as a means of getting across to an audience and so it's not just that the audience is losing these these creators it's not just these artists who are not going to come back that you as a viewer of youtube are going to lose but those people who are not coming back to the likes of youtube and facebook and twitter they're actually kind of being cut out a little bit a little bit by their own hand admittedly 
uh, from the broader culture of the internet, at least insofar as it is it occurs on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, which a good part of it does, not all of it. There's a huge internet other than Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, and perhaps Medium, etc. But it's there is a good part of the culture that is there. And so if you start tuning out, if you start disconnecting, if you start removing yourself voluntarily after being censored and silenced and kicked around like that, then one of the consequences is, is you stop really being in tune with what's going on in your world. To some extent, it's not really your world anymore, right? It's, it's not your community that these things are, are being discussed and happening around. You're part of a, a broader internet community rather than the Facebook one. But you start getting kind of disconnected. And I'm noticing that I, I just had a, a barbecue where a bunch of people I know showed up at. And we seem to talk a little bit less about the news than I would kind of expect. Now, maybe it was just nothing was going on that's interesting right now. Maybe it's that it's summer and it's kind of a slow period. And so maybe there, there's no burning fires that need to be put out right at this moment. And that a lot of the burning fires have kind of already done their damage. We've already got the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We've already got the new NAFTA. We've already got anti-terror laws and all these terrible things. And it's not getting worse as quickly because it's already pretty bad. And there's something to be said for that. But I think some of it is that we're just getting disconnected from each other by this censorship. And that the both the alternative media on the left and the right and the mainstream media is suffering because of it. Because we're we're losing this this ability to connect because the censorship is pushing people away and voices are being lost. So I, I just wanted to kind of bring that up a little bit. Because uh, what's going on? Uh, well, the first thing we've got here isn't, of all things, InfoWars story. Which, again, InfoWars take with a little bit of grain of salt. But I think, like, I've been able to, to notice some of the... The, the crackdown on YouTube this week, which was, is kind of the, the number one story. All kinds of news organizations, big and small, have covered this. Uh, I've just pulled a couple off of the top to kind of give an impression of how big of a deal this is and who is affected, etc. So from InfoWars' perspective, the, the angle they're going to focus on is going to be relating to the mass immigration. And so, quote, report YouTube to label criticism of immigration, quote, hate speech, unquote. New policy, big tech's latest push against conservative voices. Pause. So, I know we we're only at the headline. We're not very far in this. But the conservative side want, really wants this to be a push against conservatives. And Infowars sees it this way. Prison Planet sees it this way. A lot of the, the right-wing media that I've seen that is freaking out about this, which they should be. It's a good thing that they're freaking out about this. But they view it entirely in terms of its effect on the right. And according, if you would read these, these news reports on this issue, you would get the impression that it's only targeting those against immigration and those against the political left in the United States. And I want to make the point here that it's actually not just targeting the right. I mean, I've been hit by one of these uh, issues, not on, on YouTube, my YouTube account keeps getting hit with copyright uh, issues, but on Twitter, the, the, the same wave of censorship snagged my account, right? I'm certainly not on the right. I'm one example. There are others. There's enough people on the left who are being snagged by this that we shouldn't treat this as something just happening to the right. But we should treat it as something that is happening to the right. And so to the extent that they're talking about what's actually happening in the accounts that are actually being hit, then yes, it is affecting the right. So anyway, continuing on, quote, Immigration status has been declared a protected category on YouTube's hate speech policy, effectively banning speech critical of illegal immigration, experts warn. Experts. Uh -huh. Quote, even though the policy specifies YouTube will only remove content that promotes violent or hatred towards individuals or groups based on that attribute, conservatives are concerned that the policy will be used to justify the removal of accurate criticism of immigration policies. YouTube's new policy on hate speech includes immigration status, says Swedish independent journalist Peter Emanuelsson. And how much do you want to bet that guy 
There's more to that story. But anyway, continuing on. In other words, you cannot c criticize immigration anymore. This is YouTube taking a left-wing political stance. Con censorship of conservative opinions is getting worse on social media. Quote, this is Orwellian. YouTube's new policy on hate speech includes immigration status. In other words, you cannot criticize immigration anymore. Duh. I guess that's exactly what they just said. Hey, anyway. uh, quote, given big tech's track record of left-leaning bias, a simple criticism towards immigration being viewed as hate is unlikely. End quote. So, uh, first of all, so, again, they're trying to, to paint this as having a track record of left-leaning bias. Now, there may be a left-leaning bias somewhere in there, but the last data I saw was from a lawsuit, I think it was between... Uh, Info Wars or, or Alex Jones and Google or something along those lines and they tried to to prove that Google had a left-wing bias in its censorship on YouTube and they found that they actually had a right-wing bias according to their Google's own data and that they were removing more left-wing sources than they were removing right-wing sources and I've kind of pointed out elsewhere that one of the the tendencies on the political right, especially in the United States, is for people to take what they're told and to kind of run with it uncritically. And the consequence of that is that you get some voices that are really, really loud on the political right, like, for example, Infowars, Fox News, etc., Bill O'Reilly, perhaps. And then there's a lot of other voices, but they're, you don't know about them. You don't really hear about them. They're just some guy in the States, right? Whereas on the left side, politically, if you go both at Twitter and other mediums where people have voices that can be heard, there are people with big, loud voices and that are prominent on the left, but there are more of them. And it's a more diverse group. It's a more spread out a group of individuals, or if we can kind of refer to them that way. And so when censorship hits these two types of groups, if a person on the right is censored and he's one of these prominent voices, it does a tremendous amount of damage to the conversation in, or on the political right because so many people listen to that one voice that their removal is really noticeable. Whereas if, even if it's more censorship happening on the left, it's just as likely that the voices that are being removed on the left will not be listened to and viewed as uncritically as universally and so people won't take it as seriously. And so even if there's more censorship on the left, the right is going to freak out about it more. So uh, I th that is what I personally think is happening, and I think the data will bear that out. But nevertheless, if YouTube is banning people who are, again, kind of too far out on immigration issues, that is something that is typically more associated with the right. And it is conceivable that if you live in a country, you may or may not want other people to come to the country. If you go back to my slippery slope video, that was one of the, the issues that was kind of brought up in that, in that you really do change the nature and character of your country depending on who is and is not allowed into it. And there is an argument to be made for restricting or not restricting uh, people from entering into a particular area, country, province, etc., either by rule of law, by structures like walls, for example. You can disagree with the United States in particular having a wall. You can disagree with the cost involved in creating one, or even just the fact that you're dividing humanity by creating a wall between people. But at the same time, that, that's a discussion that can be made. And it can be made peacefully, it can be made logically, it could be made on, on a variety of levels. And the need to silence people who just happen to want to divide their group of people, their nation, from other groups or other nations, I think it, it, it's a, it goes a step too far. And you two taking this stance, it, it's, it's, it's a battle that it, it's like, it, it's not just that it, it, it's a step too far, but it's only going to piss people off. Because that means every single national boundary, and there's about 180 countries or 190 different countries, so figure out how many of them have borders with other countries. There are reasons for the, those borders to be there. Now, you can take a stance, for like a, the anarchist stance, right, for example, where you, you don't really believe that any of those borders are, are legitimate. And that's something that you could probably argue, and there's a good case for it. But at the same time, that's a lot of borders for 
you to have to, to make that argument and to justify it for every single one of those borders. Now, you could try to justify it on the sense that, oh, they're all borders, therefore they're all wrong. And again, that, that's an argument you can make. That's fine. But you, you have to argue against the status quo. And that argument has to be made with people who believe the current system that involves countries with borders. And that is going to involve people on the other side coming up with reasons why they should or shouldn't adopt what you think, right? And so YouTube just up and deleting and silencing people for participating in this discussion about national boundaries is, is not going to wind up with a, really a, a good outcome here. Because if, if there is a value in any of the individual boundaries anywhere in the world, then that discussion will fail. And we will have the wrong outcome of that discussion, or it's very likely that the wrong outcome of that discussion will, will occur. So that's what's happening on YouTube. So the next thing I kind of wanted to bring up is, again, YouTube. YouTube banning extreme, extremist content, quote unquote. So this is from Moonman, who's a pretty cool guy on the Fediverse, runs a shit poster club instance, which is one of the coolest instances on the Fediverse. And he makes the po point here that, quote, here's what's going to happen in retaliation. Nothing. You have no power. Google wins. End quote. And so I, I wanted to kind of bring this up because this censorship, this mass controlling of the, the narrative from the perspective of Google, it, they have a lot of political power. And it is actually a, a compelling argument that with the amount of power that they have and the apathy of their viewers, uh, that it's likely that probably nothing is going to come of this. And you're going to get a lot of conservatives and a lot of people on the political left are just not going to be able to broadcast on YouTube anymore, or they're going to be forced to start over again collecting their followers. And I mean, it takes a lot of work to get a lot of followers. Like, you could probably buy followers. It's still probably possible to do that. But it's probably not cheap to get that many, right? And I mean, I, I've been broadcasting on, on this YouTube channel for a good couple of years now with a couple hundred videos, and I've got a whole maybe 40 people watching them. And some people have like hundreds of thousands of followers, and it took a lot of work to get that connected with people who are interested in their message. And so they're going to have to start all over again, which in some cases, maybe it's not a huge, uh, you know, not that bad of a thing. If Nazis, for example, have to go through a little bit of work uh, to, to reclaim their base, fine, whatever. But the problem here is, what do you do if they do go too far? And what is the, the YouTube viewership going to do when YouTube takes that step. Make you disagree with me that the discussion on immigration shouldn't, and, and walls, for example, shouldn't just be silenced, of course. That's fine, but the rate that they're adding new topics and new ideas to the list of ideas you can't question, and list of topics you can't talk about in the way that may be natural to do so, it's likely that they're going to keep going, and they're going to keep adding issues and then the question then is, what do you do about it? What can the world do about Google? Like, you, you can say, okay, let's, let's stop using Google for things. You can do stuff like using ProtonMail instead of Gmail, and uh, using Marble and OpenStreetMap instead of Google Maps. And there's everything that Google does, there's probably an alternative waiting to take what Google does away from them a little bit. Some of them work better than others. But I, I, I think there's, there's kind of an extra step that is missing from this situation, which is that there's billions, literally billions of Google users out there. And there's, there's more of us than there are of them. And there's no real reason why Google should have the ability to whip their user base around as they have been doing. Now, how far can we go on this? Eh, it's debatable. Uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily, you know, I'm not gonna call for things that are illegal to call for in Canada, for example, but, you can probably use your imagination a little bit and just imagine what would happen if the people who use Google really actually did get pissed off at the way that they are being treated. It's conceivable that they wouldn't be able to put up with very much pressure, very much pressure at all. Uh, and so when Google does things like banning quote unquote extremist content, uh, it's worth thinking about forming groups outside of Google, of course, to actually address this and to, to rally public support. Now, one of the ways you can do that is by talking, on it on talking about it on shows like this. That's one of the things you can do. But 
there, there's probably others that are possible to do if we could get enough people who are pissed off enough to do it. So think about that. Anyway. So third thing, this would have been from the New York Times if the New York Times was not restricting people from reading their newspaper. So this was YouTube to remove thousands of videos pushing extreme views. That's all the data I'm able to get because YouTube or because the New York Times does not allow people to read their paper. Thanks New York Times for such an insightful take on this issue. Next, we have uh, the uh, GHCQ proposal to eavesdrop on encrypted messages. So this is from Slashdot, quote, tech giants, civil society groups, Ivy League security experts have condemned a proposal from Britain's eavesdropping agency as a, quote, serious threat to digital security and fundamental human rights. From the report, quote, in an open letter to the GHCQ, 47 signatories, including Apple, Google, which this is to Google's credit, continuing on, and WhatsApp have jointly urged the cybersecurity agency to abandon its plans for a so-called, quote, ghost protocol. It comes after intelligence officials of the GHCQ propose a way which they believe law enforcement access or could access end-to-end -end encrypted communications without undermining the privacy, security, or confidence of other users. Details of the initiative were first published by, in an essay by two of the UK's highest cybersecurity officials in November 2018. Ian Levy, the technical director of Britain's National Security or, or National Cyber Security Center, and Chris Ken Robinson, GHCQ's head of cyber or crypt analysis, the technical blah blah, uh, put forward a process that would attempt to avoid breaking encryption. The pair said it would be relatively easy for a service provider to silently add a law enforcement participant to a group chat or call. So basically, what they're going to do is they're going to allow companies like Facebook and Google to have end-to-end -end encrypted chats but they're going to require as a condition of their allowing this uh, for google to have a fourth or third or whatever person added to every single chat that exists on their platform and that's the ghcq and of course when facebook is required to do this for the uk they're going to be required to do it for the us and they're going to be required to do it for canada and they're going to be required to do it for australia and maybe they'll only do one for the whole five eyes but when the five eyes do it Facebook's going to get the same request from China. And then that's going to be an interesting question because will Facebook t bow to the government of China or will they just plan to be blocked? And if they're just blocked, will people from Facebook be able to communicate with people in China? That's one possible downside of this. Either China's going to be allowed to listen to or they're not going to be allowed to listen and we're going to see a fragmentation of the internet and our ability to communicate globally. Two really bad case scenarios. The second problem is that means there's going to be basically one password or one account that if you can get access to it, you're going to get access to basically every communication in the world, whether or not you're actually the GHCQ. And so there's going to be this big gaping security hole in these communications platforms that has already been thought through 10, 20 years ago when we went through the first crypto war and it was a bad idea then it's still a bad idea now it introduces more of a, a attack surface for attackers and because it's so large as an attack surface uh, we can expect that it's probably going to be compromised at some point just as the vault 7 compromises of the cia has led to ransomware having access to the cia's tools that have allowed them to do stuff like lock the city of baltimore down the same kind of th problem is going to apply here it, just by giving this power to the five eyes intelligence agencies, you are opening up this problem that it could very well be opened, this, this access that could very well be taken from them by a clever hacker, uh, whether it's just the Chinese intelligence service compromising them or the Russians, uh, or just some poor teenager somewhere who just gets lucky. It could very well be either or. And so that that is kind of a threat to that. But the... Even ignoring that, though, even ignoring the the problem of what if this goes wrong, what exactly are they proposing here? They're literally proposing that the intelligence agencies of the Five Eyes are going to listen to every single chat room, and they're going to do it with the consent of Facebook or with the consent of Google, because Google is going to keep operating, right? Facebook's going to keep operating. They're, I don't see them pulling a lav a bit and just shutting down their end-to-end -end encrypted chats. If this was becoming, if this would become mandatory, so it, it, it pushes our society into 
it, we're kind of already there in a sense. Like if you're chatting on Facebook, they probably are already listening to you. Uh, but you can use things like Ricochet. And one of the arguments for using Ricochet is there is this added level of security where they are not listening to you. So it's worth thinking about, like, why why we're, we're willing to put up with not just Google, but these intelligence agencies restricting our ability to communicate privately. Again, it's it, the there is a need for an organized political response. Maybe we'll, we'll get into the details of how that could be accomplished later. But needless to say, one of the things you need for organized political response is a, an ability to communicate with groups privately, whether it's in person, on paper, uh, or over the internet, it doesn't matter. We need to be able to have this level of privacy so we can plan, we can organize against these kinds of issues. Okay, next thing going on is an article by the Open Privacy Research Society, openprivacy.ca, which by the way is a great organization, definitely deserving of your uh, attention, dollars, what have you. But they apparently in April, so this is a little while ago now, quote, filed an intervention with the CRTC opposing fair play. So, quote, Re recently we filed an intervention with the CRTC opposing fair play website blocking proposal. And I've got the intervention here. Let's see here. I, down I think I downloaded it, but it didn't show up. Let me see if I can grab it quickly. In any case, so long story short, the government is implementing or talking about implementing kill switches on the internet that Bell and Rogers specifically are going to be f forced, quote unquote, to become, quote, copyright enforcement agencies by, and, quote, forced to become censors. Uh, quote, we, we see this as a profound change from the current approach, which respects internet service provider, providers' roles as neutral intermediaries by treating any mandated ISP protection as an exceptional measure to be considered carefully, reluctantly, and alongside other remedies that may be less intrusive and more effective. So instead, they, the coalition of Bell and Rogers proposes the CRTC make ISP blocking easier and routine by creating an overseeing and administrative body, the quote, independent piracy review agency that would maintain and publish a block list of sites, a blacklist uh, of this body's finding of sites that had a relationship to piracy. Now note, this is what other countries like Australia have already done. There are already, countries, more than a couple now, that have these blacklists. And the first thing that happens is you get stuff like 2600 Magazine, the Hacker Quarterly. Even though there's nothing really illegal in them, you get people who talk about blacklists. You get civil liberties groups. You get people who talk about abortion. You get people who talk about sexual reproductive health. You get people who pr provide mental health support services for people who are affected by traumatic incidences. You get all kinds of people caught in these blacklists. And once you're on that blacklist, it is really, really hard to get yourself off. And it's really easy to expand the blacklist to include political enemies. Enemies of the RIAA and Music Canada, for example. Enemies of the AFM, the Federation of Musicians. You Merely having a blog that is critical of the RIAA is probably enough to get you on the blacklist. And if it isn't now, it could be in five years. So the, their quote, we're calling a quote, easy kill switch system like this censorship. Uh, we do so not because we think creators shouldn't have the opportunity to be paid for their work, but because quote, copyright protection is just the Trojan horse this particular censorship attempt is dressed in. Anytime those seeking to quote, enforce a law turn to mechanisms to make it easier to block speech, hard questions must be asked. Because content kill switches weaken systems and enable easy overreach. Too frequently, this overreach has resulted in resources being taken away from marginalized communities. In 2013, for example, the four largest UK ISPs all voluntarily adopted uh, opt-out filtering, the UK's, quote, family filters. Censorship dressed up in a, quote, think of the children, Trojan horse. This naturally led to a disproportionate overblocking of material relating to sexual education and health domestic abuse support, suicide prevention, government politicians, and resources aimed at LGBT youth. In the United States, where SOPA slash PIPA laws, which are less draconian than the Fair Play Canada proposals, were banned in 2012 after a massive outcry, a current package of laws known as FOSTA and SESTA is having a similar chilling effect, despite not having been adopted as of this writing. So, 
they were still working on that at this point. Reddit has banned a number of communities. Craigslist has removed their personal sections. More fundamentally, Microsoft has changed their terms of service to ban, quote, offensive speech inside video and audio calls passing through their platform, as well as incorporating surveillance of audio and video calls. Pounce.org has removed itself entirely from the web. Backpage has been seized by the U.S. government. And the list goes on, uh, on and on and on. So they talk a little bit more about the, the U.K. and Sesta and Fosta. But long story short, the don't play or the, the Fair Play Initiative is really talking about breaking the Internet at a fundamental level and breaking what we can and cannot read, removing our access to media, uh, removing our access to culture, and making the federal government in Canada, through the CRTC, through these captured by Rogers and Bell bureaucrats, responsible for what we are and are not allowed to see, communicate with, and read on the Internet. And this is the sort of thing that dictatorships do, right here, is restricting the ability to publish, the ability to read, and having blacklists of who is and is not allowed to be seen, of what you're allowed to, 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 to read, etc. And again, the, the blacklist, once enabled, will only ex expand and extend. And we can bet that special interest groups are going to want to add their chosen uh, topic to the blacklist as soon as the technical capability is there for them to have it and as, as soon as there's a legal precedence for them to use it. And so Bell is playing with fire and Unifor specifically is pro fair play. That's what the, the hashtag don't, don't censor. Yeah, I think it's don't censor is open media's hashtag on this. It's, it, it's unbelievable that Unifor, the union that should be protecting people's right to organize, uh, would push forward a attempt by Bell and Rogers to restrict our ability to discuss union matters on the internet. I've worked in a workplace where merely using the word union you could get fired for. This is the same sort of thing. If every website that talks about organizing unions gets added to this block list, which it could in a heartbeat, then yeah, un Unifor is going to be in a dark place because suddenly they're not going to be able to organize other workplaces, at least digitally. And sure, they could do it offline. There's, they've got a wide enough reach. They can probably get away with it. But smaller unions are not going to be able to, to pull it off. And if you're the type of person who wants to, to organize your workplace and wants to do some research on how to do that, right now the best place to do that is on the Internet, right? And if the Bell and Rogers gets their way, that's the sort of thing that's going to be cut from our lives. That's what we're going to be no longer able to access. And sure, right now you can go to a library. But... In fact, a lot of what librarians do is they just go on the internet and do the search for you because they know how to do that effectively. If they're not allowed to access a material because it's banned in Canada, that's, again, not <laughs> your, even libraries are going to be harmed by this. And so uh, there, there really is, uh, the only way out is to stop Unifor, to stop Bell, to stop Rogers, to, again, organize now to support groups like openprivacy.ca and up to to actually start pushing back against this stuff. And again, I'm not, I haven't talked about how to do that much in this video specifically, but start talking to the people around you. Like start trying to see, is there a way we can we can start to stop this? What what kind of groups can we organize into to, to start putting pressure on this? Is are the political parties enough? Is it just enough that we vote? Is it just enough that we talk about it and vote? Or is it time to actually get organized? Think about it. Anyway, that is, I guess, all for today. We're kind of out of time, but uh, did I have another clip to play here? I don't think I do. I think that was actually it. So, uh, as usual, if you like this broadcast and want to see it continue after my big move, then definitely support it on subscribers, Star Villages, or with Bitcoin. And if you have any suggestion of things you'd want, mentioned or talked about, or especially Creative Commons Media, give me a link. I will give it a listen uh, and see what I think about it. And uh, as usual, I will see you next week, hopefully with uh, someone, a special guest who will actually show up. That would be nice. So I will see you all then.